Uh, in the gospel, of, according to Luke chapter number 12, we have here a parable uh, by Jesus. It's often referred to as the parable of the um, barren fig tree. A parable, of course, is an earthly story used to illustrate a heavenly truth. And in the gospel, according to Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse number 6, the new revised standard version of the Bible reads thusly. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, sir, let it alone for one year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. I want to use for a preaching topic this morning, growing through. Don't just go through. <laughs> I want to talk about growing through. Allow me to begin this sermon today by offering a very, very, very valuable piece of information. Listen carefully, because this might be the most helpful advice you get all week. Y'all ready? I'm fit to help somebody. Here it is. Don't believe everything you read on the internet. Lord have mercy. Not only is the internet an outlet for fake news, um, it's also swarming with fake quotes. And here's something else. Just because there's a picture next to the quotation, that doesn't mean it actually came from said person. There are a myriad of uh, misquoted and, uh, and, and, and just wrong things on the internet, but the one I want to call your attention to, which is very popular, uh, is this right here. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Uh, this proverb, if you want to call it that, is often misattributed to Albert Einstein, Benjamin Franklin, and even Mark Twain, none of whom had anything to do with this convincing yet untrue definition. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is not the definition of insanity. Insanity is actually a legal term pertaining to a defendant's ability to determine right from wrong when a crime is committed. In court, a defendant can potentially be found not guilty by reason of insanity if his or her lawyer can provide clear and convincing evidence that the client was suffering from a severe mental illness that prevented them from knowing that the crime committed was in fact illegal. But at any rate, Insanity is primarily a legal term that has nothing to do with doing the same thing over and over again. What I would have us to understand today is that doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is actually the definition of perseverance and persistence. It's what the Bible calls steadfastness. And whether you realize it or not, steadfastness should be our posture as people of God. To be steadfast is to be able to endure patiently. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 
somewhere else. He tells us not to grow weary in well-doing. Yeah. Why? For in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. Now, this church is what I need you to understand. The Bible does not tell us where we'll reap. Notice the distinction. The Bible doesn't say where we'll reap. We only know what we'll reap. If we don't faint, we'll reap what we've sown. And listen, I raise this point because the will to persist is often the difference between failure and success. And so, yes, sometimes you have to do the same thing over and over while expecting different results. Listen, there are some things in my life I've been praying for which have not happened yet. But that doesn't mean I stop praying. I'm going to keep on praying. I'm going to keep on hoping, hoping for different results. <laughs> Jesus did say, ask, and it shall be given. <laughs> Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door will be open. Amen. However, listen, sometimes you have to do the same thing <laughs> over and over again, expecting different results. And if you're like me today, you probably made some mistakes. You've done some things you wish you could take back. But I like the boxing analogy which says, you're not defeated just because you fail. But you lose when you stop getting back up to fight again. And this says to me, just because I've tried something before and perhaps failed, that doesn't mean that I quit and I keep hoping for a better tomorrow. Sometimes you got to pick yourself up. Help me, somebody. You got to pick yourself up off the mat and do what you've done before. Sometimes you got to pray a prayer you prayed before. Sometimes you got to sing a song you sung before. Sometimes you got to make a request you made before. Sometimes you got to continue the good work that you started before. Sometimes you got to try something that perhaps you tried before and failed. Sometimes you got to try it again. And listen, expecting something different doesn't mean you're insane. It could mean you're inspired. And while, listen, faith won't make it easy, faith makes a different result possible. I heard Jesus say that all things are possible when you believe. And listen, this is not only true when it comes to our personal and private ambitions. But patient endurance should also be the posture we assume when it comes to how we engage our community. Sometimes we use this quote about insanity. We use this in the service of cutting folk off. You know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. But what we must understand is that as followers of Jesus Christ, we are not in the business of treating folk the way we've been treated. That's not gospel. <laughs> Help me, somebody. <laughs> but we are called, we're commissioned, we are to treat people the way God has treated us. And if I could be honest today, I used to have that attitude. There are people I'll stop helping because when I gave to them before, they didn't do what they said they would do. But then I got convicted, church. God dropped something in my spirit that messed me up. Hear this. What if God blessed me only on the basis of what I would handle well? I suspect that all of us have squandered some blessings. All of us have wasted some opportunities at one point or another. Who then are we to dictate what somebody else does or does not deserve? Listen, I'm convinced today, church, that folk don't always need our scrutiny. Sometimes they just need our support. Folk don't always need a lecture from us. Sometimes they just need a lift. Folk don't always need to be excoriated, but sometimes we need to be in the business of encouraging other people. 
And listen, if grace has bought your liberty, be careful trying to withhold it from someone else. I heard Jesus say, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Listen, it's been said that among the attributes of God, although they're equal, mercy shines with even more brilliance than justice. The text under consideration seems to illustrate this point. Following a strict call to repentance, Jesus tells a parable that kind of drives home his message. He says in verse 6, a man had a fig tree that he planted in his vineyard. Now, fig trees, church, were common in Israel. In fact, fig trees and figs are mentioned more than 50 times in the Bible. Not only does this man in his vineyard plant a fig tree, but he does it with expectations. Expectations that it would be productive and that it would bear fruit. Repeatedly at the appropriate season, he came looking for fruit. However, for three years, the man's expectations were not met. While he came hoping for fruit, much to his dismay, Jesus said he found none. This was especially disappointing, given the fact that, fruit, that fig trees usually bore fruit every year. Plus, the tree was planted in a favorable location. Now, the owner's frustration is evidenced by what he says to his gardener. In verse number seven, he says, see here, for three years, I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. And so he says, cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? Now, understand, land was a precious commodity. Land was precious. The owner doesn't want this unfruitful tree using up resources that could be used to nourish a fruitful tree. There's no point in wasting good ground. Hence, he says to the gardener, cut it down. But in verse 8, the gardener intercedes by saying, sir, let it alone for one more year. Understand, he says, until I dig around it and put manure on it, he says, if it bears fruit next year, then all is well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. And listen, church, whether you realize it or not, God has some expectations of us. Come on, somebody. I know salvation is free, but I'm here to tell somebody discipleship ain't cheap. God has some expectations of us. And an important component of discipleship is fruitfulness. Among other things, fruit represents the natural growth that follows from a life with God. Psalm 1 says that those who delight themselves in the law of the Lord are like trees planted by streams of water which yield fruit in their season. In the New Testament, Paul says that those who live by the Spirit will bear fruit. And what is the fruit of the Spirit? I'm so glad you asked. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Fruit is something that in a real sense, fruit comes as a result of growth. And what I want to say to the church is, if you're truly living by the Spirit, if you're truly growing by grace, these attributes should be operative in your life. Notice in the text, after three years of waiting, after three years of going through this cycle of expectation and disappointment, the owner says, cut it down. <laughs> ah, but here comes the gardener who intercedes by saying, give it one more year. And what I want to say to the church today is that Jesus, like the gardener, not only died and and, and was raised, but the Bible says he's now seated at the right hand of God. And Jesus' church is still working. Jesus is making intercession for you and me. 
in our text, Jesus asked his listeners to identify with the fig tree. Like this fig tree, we only have but so much time to get right before judgment. I want to say it again. Like this fig tree, we only have but so much time to get right before judgment. The Bible says the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. And some folk uh, conceive slackness, but God is long-suffering. God is patient towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. God's will, God's earnest and deep desire is that all folk would repent. And so the lesson of the fig tree is a challenge to live each day. Live each day, somebody, is a gift from God. I think that's what civil rights leader Benjamin Mays had in mind with his often repeated poem entitled God's Minute. It simply says, I have only just a minute. Only 60 seconds in it forced upon me. Can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. It's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it, give account if I abuse it. It's just a tiny minute, but eternity is in it. And again, we should treat each day, treat each hour, treat each minute as a gift from God because the simple truth is that it is a gift from God. Every day that God gives us, that's a gift. And I want to suggest that it's how we live our lives. It's what we do with the time God has given us. That becomes our gift back to God. And I don't know about you, but I want to give God my absolute best. I want to give God my best. God so loved the world that he gave his best. We in turn, church, ought to give our best. We ought to give the best of our service. We ought to give the best of our worship. We ought to give the best of our praise. Psalm 103 says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Praise and bless God's holy name. The fact of the matter is the God we serve is worthy. <laughs> Help me somebody, not of our leftovers. The God we serve is worthy. <laughs> not of our lackluster performance, but the God we serve is worthy of our praise. Yeah. We got to give God we got to give God our absolute best. Folk kill me coming to church as if heaven ought to be happy just because you showed up. Folk kill me coming to church with this attitude of just kind of sit back and waiting to see what other folk going to do. Maybe just maybe God is waiting to see what you're going to do. When you come to church, listen, <laughs> we come to church like God owes us. But the reality of it is God don't, uh, we owe God a praise. We owe God our worship. We owe God the absolute best of what we have to give. How can I say thank you? How can I say thank you? For the things he's done for me. But Rizal, here's what I love. Watch this. Not only does the gardener ask for one more year, but he says, let me dig around it. Put some manure on it. Help me somebody. And give it one more year. Look, the gardener puts time and energy into the tree by loosening up the ground and applying manure to help it grow. And while I know this may be hard to see, but every now and then, you got to realize some stuff in your life, though it may stink. <laughs> Help me somebody. <laughs> though it may stink, it's really helping you grow. And listen, while it may make you uncomfortable, church, you ought to just grow through it. It may stretch your faith, but grow through it. It may test your patience, but go through it. It even may vex your un spirit, but understand growth happens when we practice stability. I heard James, the Lord brother, say, count it all joy. <laughs> yeah, when you face diverse temptations, because what you think is harming you could be helping you. Do I have a witness in here? And yeah, if you're like, I know you got some stuff in your life where you say to yourself, mm -hmm, this right here is some. 
but maybe just maybe God is using that to help you grow. Look, you wouldn't pray so hard if you didn't have some manure in your life. You wouldn't even come to church like you do if you didn't have some manure in your life. You wouldn't even read your Bible like you do. Oh, every now and then, you ought to thank God. God will put some stuff in your life to help you grow. <laughs> Y'all said I'm going to leave that right there. I preach anymore, I'm going too far. Look, while it may make you uncomfortable, church, just grow through it. And I don't know about you, but in this season of my life, I want to be more fruitful. That's my prayer today. That's my prayer for Rita Memorial Baptist Church. Lord, allow us to become more fruitful. I'm asking God to put more love in our heart, put more goodness in our work, put more patience in our spirit, put more peace in our minds, put more strength in our soul so that we won't just go through. To, oh, help me somebody. But I'm talking about that we might be able to grow Grow through. And I began this sermon by saying that you can't believe everything that you read on the internet. Even when there's a picture beside it. That don't mean it's true. That doesn't mean that it came from said person. But as I hasten to my clothes, here's something you can believe in. Here's something you can believe. You can believe in the goodness and the love of our God. And to prove his love towards us, God sent Jesus. And God didn't wait for us to get ourselves together, but the Bible says while we were yet in sin, God sent Jesus. Jesus whose coming was motivated by love. Jesus whose life reverberated with love. Jesus whose actions were driven by love. Jesus whose death was for the sake of love. And the reason you can grow through it, listen, is because the reason we can grow through it is because I want to suggest that we aren't the only ones who do the same thing over and over again expecting different results. Yeah. No, but persistence is an attribute of God. God does some of the same things over and over again to expecting different results. You don't believe me? Look, when you woke up this morning and opened two incredible gifts, your right and your left eye, God had new mercy. God had new mercy. That's why the Bible says his mercies are new every day. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad God is persistent. I'm glad God is involved. I'm glad God cares. That's why we say every time I turn around, let God keep blessing me over and over and every time I turn around. God! God keeps on blessing me. That church is how I know that we can grow through it because God is one who does the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Yeah, we talk about finding God and we sing, I'm so glad I found the Lord Jesus in time. But I would submit and suggest to us that, listen, we didn't find God. God found us. God took the initiative. God is the one who was persistent. Yeah, like a good shepherd, God is the one who will leave the 99 to go after the one which was lost. Like a woman who's lost one of her 10 coins, God is the one who will shine a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until we are found. And that's something, church, that you can believe in. Now, as I go to my seat, if you know that God is persistent, if you know that God looked beyond your faults and saw your needs, if you know that when nothing else could help, it was the shown up love of God that lifted you. You might as well do what the Bible says do. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and the mercy of God endures forever. And I know, I know about you, but I'm glad about that. God's mercy endures forever. God is faithful. God's word is enough. God's love will keep you. Is there anybody here today who's bound and determined, God, you deserve more from me. I'm going to give my best. I'm going to do the best I know how to do. I just want more of you, more of your power, more of your spirit, more of your love. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me.
come until I want no more. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise.